Much of the cultural pattern of Southern rednecks became the cultural heritage of Southern blacks, more so than survivals of African cultures with which they had not been in contact for centuries. Even in colonial times, most blacks on American soil had been born on American soil. Moreover, such cultural traits followed blacks out of the southern countrysides and into the urban ghettos, north and south, where many settled. The very way of talking, later to be christened Black English, closely followed dialects brought over from those parts of Britain from which many white southerners came, though these speech patterns died out in Britain while surviving in the American South, as such speech patterns would later die out among most southern whites and among middle-class blacks, while surviving in the poorer black ghettos around the country. For example, where a northerner said, I am, you are, she isn't, it doesn't, and I haven't, a Virginian, even of high rank, preferred to say, I be, you be, she ain't, it don't, and I ain't. These Virginia speech ways were not invented in America. They derived from a family or regional dialects that had been spoken throughout the South and West of England during the 17th century. From these same regions of England came such words as yaller for yellow, axe for ask, across for across, y'all for you, bile for boil, dough for door, dis for this, and dat for that. Many of these usages have long since died out in England, though the word chitlins for hog entrails continued to be used in some localities in England, even in the 20th century, as such usage remained common among black Americans. But no such words came from Africa, nor did the holiday Kwanzaa, which originated in Los Angeles. The slaves' custom of marking their marriages by jumping over a broomstick, a custom resurrected at a posh wedding among blacks in 20th century New York as a mark of racial identity, was in fact a pagan custom in Europe in centuries past and survived for a time among southern whites. Complaints about the improvidence of whites in the South and of their ancestors in Britain before that were echoed in W.E.B. Du Bois's picture of his fellow blacks in the 1890s. Probably few poor nations waste more money by thoughtless and unreasonable expenditure than the American Negro, and especially those living in large cities. Thousands of dollars are annually wasted in amusements of various kinds and in miscellaneous ornaments and gewgaws. The Negro has much to learn of the Jew and the Italian as to living within his means and saving every penny from excessive and wasteful expenditures. It was not, however, from Jews or Italians that blacks had absorbed their culture. Du Bois's description of the spending habits of blacks in the 1890s was echoed by a contemporary observer, Jacob Rees, who said that the Negro loves fine clothes and good living a good deal more than he does a bank account. Similar observations have been made by many others over the years, inside and outside the black community. For the lower socioeconomic classes among blacks, Gunnar Myrdal's descriptions of them near the middle of the 20th century still bore a remarkable resemblance to descriptions of southern whites and their regional forebears in Britain, including less resourcefulness, disorganized family life, lax sexual morals, and recklessness, with tendencies toward aggression and violence. Despite a generally sympathetic approach to the study of blacks in his landmark book, An American Dilemma, which has often been credited with a major influence on the advancement of civil rights, Myrdal also noted the low standards of efficiency, reliability, ambition, and morals actually displayed by the average Negro. He observed something of the devil-may-care attitude in the pleasure-seeking of Negroes, and a general attitude in which life becomes cheap and crime not so reprehensible. Like other observers, Myrdal tended to attribute to slavery such aspects of black culture as the low regard for human life, when in fact antebellum whites had exhibited this same reckless disregard of lethal dangers and so had their ancestors in Britain. Unlike many others, however, Myrdal also recognized the influence of the southern white culture on the culture of blacks pointing out that the general southern pattern of illegality maintained this low regard for human life. He also noted that the so-called Negro dialect is simply a variation on the ordinary southern accent, that religious emotionalism was borrowed from and sanctioned by religious behavior among whites in the South, and that the Negro trait of audaciousness is characteristic of white southerners too.
He quoted black scholar and later statesman Ralph Bunch. White Southerners employ many of the defense mechanisms characteristic of the Negro. They often carry a chip on the shoulder. They indulge freely in self-commiseration. They rather typically, and in real Negro fashion, try to overcome a feeling of inferiority by exhibitionism, raucousness in dress, and exaggerated self-assertion. Although Dr. Bunch presented these as parallels, historically it was, of course, the Southern whites who first had these patterns, reflecting patterns among their ancestors in Britain. In much of the literature on black culture, however, the supposed influence of slavery has been far more sweepingly assumed, and the cultural influence of white Southerners and their forebears in Britain largely ignored. Attempts to derive the black manner of speaking from slavery and its parallel among whites as an influence from black speech were answered by a Southern historian, who asked, From whence came the drawl of the people of the upper Great Plains and of the Blue Ridge, Smoky, and Cumberland Mountains, who have had little or no contact with the Negro? Another cultural historian of Southerners aptly observed that Southerners, white and black, share the bonds of a common heritage, indeed a common tragedy, and often speak a common language, however seldom they may acknowledge it. Half a century after Myrdal, another study of racial attitudes noted the intimidating ethnic style of many underclass black males, and noted that nearly half of all murder victims in America were black and that 94% of them were killed by other blacks. Many of these killings were due to gang members who killed for such reasons as cause he look at me funny, cause he give me no respect, and other reasons reminiscent of the touchy pride and hair-trigger violence of rednecks and crackers in an earlier era. The neglect and disdain of education found among antebellum white Southerners has been echoed not only in low performance levels among ghetto blacks, but perhaps most dramatically in a hostility toward those black students who are conscientious about their studies, who are accused of acting white, a charge that can bring anything from social ostracism to outright violence. So much attention has been paid to questions of ability that few have looked at cultural attitudes. One of those who has is black professor and best-selling author Shelby Steele, who sees in many of these children almost a determination not to learn, even though, once outside the school and in their own neighborhoods, these same children learn everything. He drew on his own experiences teaching at a university. For some years, I have noticed that I can walk into any of my classes on the first day of the semester, identify the black students, and be sadly confident that on the last day of the semester, a disproportionate number of them will be at the bottom of the class, far behind any number of white students of equal or even lesser ability. Statistical data substantiate these impressions. Black students typically perform academically below the level of those white students with the same mental test scores, in contrast to Asian American students, who perform better than white students with the same test scores as themselves. In short, even though black students average lower test scores than either white or Asian American students, those test scores are not necessarily the sole, nor perhaps even the predominant, reason for lower black academic achievement. Indeed, it is possible that the lower test scores may be a result of cultural attitudes, and of actions or inactions over a period of years based on those attitudes, more so than a cause of academic failures. While it has long been known that, historically, the average IQ of blacks has been about 85, compared to a national average of 100, what has not been so widely known is that the average IQ of blacks in the North was for years consistently higher than that of blacks in the South. A 1942 study of freshmen at black colleges found the superiority of freshmen from northern schools over those from southern schools was found to persist throughout the colleges. As already noted, black soldiers from some northern states scored higher on mental tests than whites from some southern states during the First World War. From that same era, European immigrants from cultures where education was not a high priority for ordinary people, parts of Eastern and Southern Europe, for example, scored no higher on mental tests than American blacks, and, in some communities, their children scored lower than northern black children attending the same schools. The low test scores of some European immigrant children cannot be automatically attributed to their being new to the United States. 
There have been settled communities of whites with test scores similar to those of blacks, where these have been culturally isolated people, such as the inhabitants of the Hebrides Islands off Scotland or people living in Tennessee mountain communities, hillbillies, or inhabitants of canal boat communities in Britain. In short, some kinds of cultures tend to produce lower mental test scores, whether the people in those cultures are black or white, American or European. As someone has aptly said, the tests are not unfair. Life is unfair, and the tests measure the results. No one chooses which culture to be born into or can be blamed for how that culture evolved in centuries past. In business ownership, as in other ways, the pattern among black Americans has followed the pattern of rednecks in earlier times, with people from other groups owning most of the businesses in black neighborhoods. Some may try to explain the lack of locally owned businesses in the ghettos by racial discrimination or poverty, but as early as the 1920s, there were numerous black-owned businesses in Harlem, the majority of which were owned by blacks from the Caribbean, not blacks from the American South, who were the majority population of Harlem. Although New York was the principal destination of blacks from the Caribbean, then as now, the 1930 census showed that there were more than four times as many native-born blacks in Manhattan as there were foreign-born blacks. In a parallel to differences between Southern and non-Southern whites, a study of West Indian blacks in the United States noted that the Negro immigrants, particularly the British West Indians, bring a zest of learning that is not typical of the native-born population. While black Americans have long been overrepresented among people in prison, a study of the racial composition of New York State's Sing Sing prison in the early 1930s found that black West Indians were underrepresented relative to their share of the population, at a time when native born black Americans were overrepresented several fold among Sing Sing inmates. During that same era, when American born black women and West Indian black women both worked in New York City's garment district, the latter were more frequently found at the skilled tasks. More generally, the study found that the black immigrant brings a cultural heritage that is vastly different from that of the American Negro. The first black borough presidents of Manhattan were West Indians. As late as 1970, the highest-ranking blacks in New York's police department were West Indians, as were all the black federal judges in the city. The 1970 census showed that black West Indian families in the New York metropolitan area had 28% higher incomes than the families of American blacks. The incomes of second-generation West Indian families living in the same area exceeded that of black families by 58%. Neither race nor racism can explain such differences. Nor can slavery, since native-born blacks and West Indian blacks both had a history of slavery. Studies published in 2004 indicated that an absolute majority of the black alumni of Harvard were either West Indian or African immigrants, or the children of these immigrants. Somewhat similar findings have emerged in studies of some other elite colleges. With blacks, as with whites, the redneck culture has been a less achieving culture. Moreover, that culture has affected a higher proportion of the black population than of the white population since only about one-third of all whites lived in the antebellum South, while nine-tenths of all blacks did. From the 1960s onward, much of the transplanted Southern culture would, like black English, be seen as sacrosanct features of a distinctive black identity, despite their mirroring very similar cultural patterns among Southern whites in times past. Not all black Americans, of course, retain this anachronistic culture, for the spread of education and the growing experience of the counterproductive effects of the southern redneck way of life eroded it over time for many blacks, as happened also among the whites who brought this culture over from Britain. Even during the era of slavery, those blacks who were house servants in more educated homes tended to pick up a different culture, giving their descendants enduring advantages over the descendants of field hands. Contemporary black ghetto culture in the United States is not, however, a simple linear extrapolation from the culture of Southern whites. First of all, most black Americans today are no longer part of the ghetto culture. Moreover, aside from influences peculiar to the circumstances of blacks, profound changes in the larger American society around them have also had an influence, both positive and negative. The burgeoning of the American welfare state in the second half of the 20th century 
and the declining effectiveness of the American criminal justice system at the same time allowed borrowed and counterproductive cultural traits to continue and flourish among those blacks who had not yet moved beyond that culture, thereby prolonging the life of a chaotic, counterproductive, dangerous, and self-destructive subculture in many urban ghettos. Crime and violence were among the features of this subculture that were artificially prolonged. Prior to the 1960s, while black males had a higher murder rate than other males, their murder rate was also declining more sharply than the general murder rate. Subsequently, the general murder rate in the United States and the murder rate for black males both reversed and began rising sharply, that of black males more sharply than others. In short, The drastic changes in law enforcement and social morality during the 1960s had particularly adverse effects on the behavior and actions of blacks and on black victims of the criminals in their midst. Intellectuals have also played a role, along with the welfare state, in prolonging and legitimizing a counterproductive culture among blacks. Nowhere was the effect of the white liberalism of the 1960s on the social evolution of black culture more devastating than in the disintegration of the black family. The raw facts are these. As of 1960, 51% of black females between the ages of 15 and 44 were married and living with their husbands. Another 20% were divorced, widowed, or separated. And only 28% had never been married. 20 years later... Only 31% of black women in these age brackets were married and living with their husbands, while 48% had never married. By 1994, an absolute majority, 56%, of black women in these age brackets were never married, and only 25% were married and living with their husbands. Accordingly, while two-thirds of black children were living with both parents in 1960, only one-third were by 1994. While only 22% of black children were born to unmarried women in 1960, 70% were by 1994. White liberals, instead of comparing what has happened to the black family since the liberal welfare state policies of the 1960s were put into practice, compare black families to white families and conclude that the higher rates of broken homes and unwed motherhood among blacks are due to a legacy of slavery. But why the large-scale disintegration of the black family should have begun a hundred years after slavery is left unexplained. Whatever the situation of the black family relative to the white family, in the past or the present, it is clear that broken homes were far more common among blacks at the end of the 20th century than they were in the middle of that century or at the beginning of that century, even though blacks at the beginning of the 20th century were just one generation out of slavery. The widespread and casual abandonment of their children and of the women who bore them by black fathers in the ghettos of the late 20th century was, in fact, a painfully ironic contrast with what had happened in the immediate aftermath of slavery a hundred years earlier, when observers in the South reported desperate efforts of freed blacks to find family members who had been separated from them during the era of slavery. A contemporary journalist reported meeting black men walking along the roads of Virginia and North Carolina, many of whom had walked across the state or across more than one state looking for their families. Others reported similar strenuous and even desperate efforts of newly freed blacks to find members of their families. 